I'm sorry. Welcome. Welcome to the show that put the eh and personality and the, and the harm in the word charm. Oh, and for you who are watching this on television, uh, you might check your scheduling. We're considering changing the name of the program from New Intelligence to Idiot Entertainment. <laughs> and for those of you who are watching on your radio, never mind. <laughs> Won't do any good. And now the news. How men get to be like they are ordinarily. One man invented what he seemed to be based on what he thought he wanted to be, which was based on ideas he had taken from other sources, which he had been impressed by, based on what he seemed to be. <laughs> Seemingly a pretty sticky situation. But the horses on a carousel cannot be considered captives unless they cease to be wood and become conscious. Men enjoy believing that they invent themselves. It is such a pleasant notion at times when the sun is out, the weather's warm, and it seems as though the merry-go-round will go on forever. <laughs> and who but the severest of soreheads would struggle, struggle to deny themselves the natural pleasure that comes from the dizziness. Men get to be like they are by being satisfied to stay as they are. And merely thinking about change doesn't count, in case you haven't noticed. According to one little repeated creation story, when the gods originally wanted man to be further from them, they didn't physically drive him away, but rather made him swallow a part of himself and not be aware of it. As he perceived the noose to be brought near him, one man declared, I regret that I have but one mind to give to my liege. A statement which caused the executioner to scoff. You fool, you dreamer, you do not even have that much to offer. <laughs> there is yet another myth which says that in the hospital in which all men are born is a sign that tells clearly the purpose of life. But that after reading it, within those first few seconds of life, that, well, I'll just bet you can finish it up from there. <laughs> you can't. <clears throat> One man's view of it is as follows. That men were given the ability to think primarily for reason A. And were also given the ability to think for reason B. Which is to keep them mainly unaware of the existence of Reason A. <laughs> and now a related poem. Some people get it and some people don't. Few people get it and most people don't. <laughs> Life may not be fair, but at least it's hard. <laughs> if you do it right. <laughs> An old, old tale tells of the time when all of the animals of the earth held an international meeting to decide if they would continue to let man live and share this planet with them. And one lion said that he would go along with a favorable vote, but only if he never, ever heard again man speaking about fairness and justice. <laughs> well, geez, what do they expect from us? As regards being more conscious. There is actually nothing to think about. But us being thinking creatures, right there is one immediate problem. <laughs> one man had a dream that only talk would keep alive. Sometimes he mistook the dream for himself and the viewer writes, I appreciate you telling stories about one man rather than saying what you actually mean, which is all men. Mm. And I further appreciate when you say that he does this or that questionable thing sometimes rather than all the time. Appreciatively yours, one man. <laughs> there is an absolute 
literal difference between those who think and those who know. And those who merely think never know it. And throwing open the closet door in his wife's bedroom, Zeus demanded of the figure hiding therein, What do you mean, merely think? No. <laughs> One guy says, How come you never hear a rat say, I smell a rat? <laughs> While climbing in the mountains one day, a boy asked his father to point out a more conscious man when they passed one. <laughs> All stories do not have an ending like you'd expect. <laughs> when one man realized what everyone else had already thought, he thought it too. It's hard to understand why some believe that things are falling apart. A stomach asked a brain, how's it going? And the brain replied, great, how's by you? Oh, just fine, said the stomach. Well, that's good, said the brain. Yeah, it is, said the stomach. And things became quiet as that about seemed to cover it. <laughs> A boy once asked his father, is there any relationship between the ideas of a stomach and a brain and of knowing and thinking? And the elder replied, have you been eating those metaphor berries again? No. A proverb a day time. There are no private vices. Mm -hmm. If you're alive and it's something other humans do, uh -huh. then it couldn't be more public and common. <laughs> A man who says that reason rules his life is a dunce. A man who says that he rules his life is the first man's idiot brother. <laughs> the warden told all the prisoners, you are not prisoners. <laughs> and they all believed him. <laughs> well, almost all. Today's travel news if you're not going anywhere, it doesn't matter whether you know whether you're going or not. If, you, if you're not going anywhere, it doesn't matter whether you know where you're going or not. That's what I just said. And now today's theological update. Immediately after God gave Adam his thinking cap and threw him out of the garden, Adam began to wonder if God actually existed. And now backing up to update today's travel news. If you don't know the reality behind the words you and men use, then it doesn't matter whether you know anything or not. Because what you believe that you know is not knowing, but merely thinking, which will take you nowhere of any consequence. Sweet Jesus, sighed one chap, what a blessed relief to be no more on illusionary journeys. Quick, said a father to a son, what's the primary purpose of civilization? To make men serious, replied the oh-so-insightful son. <laughs> One day, while some mountains were exploring a boy and his father, a small peak said to a larger boot, If we pass a mental elevation that surpasses the normal thinking level, will you point it out to me? To which the latter replied, Silly hillet. <laughs> The speaker addressed the crowd thusly, there are two types of mystical teachers, those who teach and those who don't. Which type would you like, with onions or without? And the mob, being out of their minds, roared their approval. <laughs> <clears throat> now, just to make up for it, a crowd wants to address two mystical teachers thusly. What is more satisfying than to get things kind of balanced out at the end of a thing. <laughs> if you merely think, then there are many little mysteries in life. But if you know, then there's only one. Which is, why did I ever start thinking in the first place? <laughs> is that rhetorical? Asked the lad. No, replied his dad. That was a pre-war Studebaker. <laughs> On one world, everyone believed that they had two minds, which had basis in fact. 
And yet still, they managed to misconstrue it to the point of uselessness. Man, oh man, mused one shop. Are there some neat planets around here or what? And now some cranial news. One man broke his mind. But not to worry, says he. I wasn't going anywhere anyway. At age 10, a boy told his father, I feel sick. At age 20, the boy told his father, I really feel sick. And at age 30, said to his father, I am sick. <laughs> and finally, his father responded, No wonder. Look what you swallowed. <laughs> when you're born, you're as happy with life as you'll ever be. The struggle to become conscious is something else altogether. A viewer writes, it's proven really strange listening to you talk about thinking. For I used to believe that I enjoyed it. Then for a while you had me doubting my enjoyment. But now you have me enjoying it more than ever before. Though in some new way I am unable to describe. I am suspecting that this was your intention from the start. Thanks sincerely, etc. One man climbed high in a tree turned his face toward heaven and began to sing. If you got to make a fool of somebody, then here I am, Lord, here I am. And the sky shot back, leave your name with my secretary. <clears throat> One legend says that long before there was the mental, the, the mortal effort to transcend man's normal state of consciousness, that a few men didn't even have a secretary much less a tall tree in which to climb. What with their stunted internal upward growth and all. <laughs> a certain man once attempted to contact God to complain about what some people were saying about the big guy. And in his prayers, in his mind, the reply he thought he received was garbled and difficult to understand. And the best he could make out seemed to be the words, leave your name and I'll get back to you. <laughs> Stunned does as stunned is. <laughs> if you don't know about death, you can't fear death. And if you're not aware of ignorance, you can't be, well, you know how it goes from there. And laughed suddenly, said to one man, what's the meaning of this? And the man retorted, hey, don't pull that stuff on me. You knew damn well I was just about to ask you the same thing. <laughs> one man let the least little thing bother him. And the least little thing he knew of was his own consciousness. <laughs> To stay alive, all animals at some time have to hide. Men have to hide all the time. One man fell overboard and drowned in the repetitiveness of it all. In a skunk herd, who is to say there's a funny smell? <laughs> And finally, when one man heard this type of activity reproachfully referred to as the kind of cure that, if it works, will kill you, thought, God, I hope so. What is it that is funny? What makes people laugh? Why do people laugh? And I don't mean the material. Uh, and even before you and I showed up here, there have been human minds speculating, taking it at times to be deadly, academically serious, the question. It has even been proffered that humor is the distinguishing mark, separating us from why does everybody always want me to make a joke and say, <laughs> separating us from warthogs, attorneys, and other low lives? <laughs> you people are going to you know, keep me doing this and get me disbarred. I mean, disabled. 
No, that's becoming an attorney. You know. <laughs> There's been those who, there have been camps that got off of the more physiological basis, such as saying that what distinguishes man is having an opposable thumb. <laughs> oh, opposable thumb. But uh, at any rate, it has been noted that on this planet there's only one creature that laughs, and that's man. And no one seems to be able to explain humor, and I can explain it to you. You can see it for yourself. It is never, no one ever sees it this way. Uh, it is further evidence of the fact that right in plain view, men live two parallel simultaneous lives. That's the only reason anything is funny. That's it. Good night. <laughs> For those of you still watching this on radio, I'll go ahead and continue. <laughs> you probably need it. I have been describing over the last several weeks uh, several ways to look at the fact that not theoretically and not based on some notion I'm trying to promote, but simply a detailing of what's right in front of you, that the mind does not normally see because the mind or thinking, as it's normally referred to. <laughs> uh, that was, I wasn't laughing, that was a suppressed cough. <laughs> that what passes, what is normally called thinking is one of the lives that men lead. And so thinking is never going to see it. You have to be able to unstunt your internal growth upward. You have to be able to climb into some new mountain range where you do not take the advice or the observations of mere buttes, much less a cliff. God forbid a plateau, but... Uh, was, as you should know, if you think about it a second, there has always been the notion that life has let this much seep out in, in the ordinary consciousness of humanity. The feeling, the suspicion, the theory, the myths regarding two possible lives, but it's not looked at on the basis that men are living such two lives. It's normally looked at on the basis that men are the background in which two lives are being led or two forces being fought. Uh, most common being that man is being driven by the opposing, conflicting powers of good and evil. And a more secular manner has been the idea that man has two levels of consciousness. The modern psychological version of that being the uh, subconscious and the subconscious mind. And there have been all sorts of myths having to do you know, the Greek myth of that man now is uh, because of a severe wound inflicted, severe wound. He was cut in two by one of the gods that got angry and that man is wandering around and that each person is actually just half a person of what you originally were. At any rate, it is everywhere. It is everywhere. That, and then, uh, and really, I guess, even more secular versions of the story is the uh, notion that men are driven through or by conflicting economic models I, I didn't make this up. <laughs> Plus, notice we're talking about laughing, and now you're laughing about something that's deadly serious. <laughs> I, wish, I wish Dr. Ingalls or you know, Papa Marx was here. You wouldn't be laughing, I'll bet you. <laughs> At any rate, the, on the basis, it's taken quite seriously. It's not presented in this way, but it is uh, a quite valid, passable intellectual currency that men are driven on some basic, on some level beyond their understanding that they're driven in conflicting ways such as that internally, that you're either, that you have conflicting ideas of either being a free market, a free marketer or a socialist or a, a, planned, a planned economy model. <laughs> and the same way about politics. At any rate, you have all of these theories, all of these myths that have been around. You don't need a mess, you don't need a model, you don't need a detailing. If you can take your mode of consciousness out of mere thinking and you look right in front of you and humor being a great example. People continually laugh and I have tried to point out to you that in one way, all humor ordinarily, all humor as engaged in by ordinary people has some touch of hostility, of aggression. 
Why? <laughs> that again is quite open. It's not some theory. It's just quite open. If you look in a certain way, as the test, as far as I can come up with one, if you want to see it again, is if you, if you look at the punchline to any joke, you can find some aggression. Just whatever strikes your mind that, well, that's a little nasty. I wouldn't say that to my mother. And I don't mean that the words are profane, but that it's just, you know, I wouldn't make a joke like that about my mother, let's say. You can find a bit of hostility, a bit of aggression. Just, if you just try, all you got to do is extract that, change the words around so that it, you take out that aggression, and surprise, surprise, it is not funny. Not at all. It's all gone. So what is a foot that men are the only creatures who laugh, which was enough, but... Uh, make it a little bit more interesting that all humor everything that makes man laugh has some basis in aggression uh, what is funny is the fact that men are living simultaneous parallel twin lives you're living a life of the mind and you're living a life of the body if you're an ordinary sane person the life of the body is ordinary and sane your mental life can be, shall we say, somewhat less <laughs> solid, <laughs> a bit more problematic in its uh, stability, in its ability to look after your own self-interest. Again, if you are a sane, ordinary person, you will some way get through 60 or 70 years, regardless of what your mind does. <laughs> but between here and the grave most people have several laughs and why they're laughing is the unrecognized fact that all humans are talking one life and leading another one uh, put it to you another way if you can see it humor, the whole word humor uh, I happen to know the linguistic history of this <laughs> humor was originally the simple word irony and as men got more, more and more civilized a few people thought that is a bit too pushy and so they changed <laughs> irony to humor or they at least made a synonym and that went from being a synonym to a whole other word then they looked backwards and, try, and tried to put a certain slightly different spin and connotation to the word irony but irony is really the best word for humor because what is irony I hadn't looked at the definition lately but it's based upon the fact that the result of something is not what was expected the thing being commented on was not what was expected and what was expected, let me go ahead and add the part since I'm not trying to quote a dictionary anyway, but it, it means, of course, from any definition that accepted by the collective, it means that what was expected would have been logically expected, would have been reasonably expected by reasonable people. So that's when anybody says, how ironic. What they're saying is, well, I didn't expect that. That is not what one, that's not what a reasonable, intelligent man would have expected which I know I've been through this a few weeks back, but let me go into my pseudo-sarcastic act and say, what kind of idiot would come up with such a definition? What kind of idiots would come up with the word irony? What kind of idiots are on this planet to say, well, being a reasonable man, I must say that's ironic because the result is not what I expected. <laughs> <laughs> well, where do they get off saying a reasonable, intelligent, logical man? How come you didn't expect it? <laughs> the reason they didn't expect it is they're living two lives. It is only the mental life that speaks of irony. It is the mental life that laughs. It is the thinking life of man that finds things to be ironic. If for the sake of our discussion, again, we're looking at man being cut into these two lives, which they certainly overlap and they are not discrete and to speak of in this way is simply uh, a bow to the idiot for the to the uh, limit to the uh, <laughs> is a bow to the uh, 
I'll get it, uh, is about to the, uh, is speaking the language of the mind. That sounds nice. Because the body, of course, cannot speak. And if it was divided into such a way, and as I'm saying between thinking and the body, and the body could respond at all, or could acknowledge what the mind can think and say, the body has no idea of humor. Which is why it is so easy to notice that only, of all the creatures on this planet, only men laugh. No other creature laughs. No other creature has any idea of irony. I mean, we think of irony as all sorts of things like uh, you read that one of the world's richest men or women dies of uh, anorexia. And you think, how ironic. One of the world's, the scion of one of the world's richest families, and she dies, starved to death, in a castle in Spain. <laughs> And we, all, we understand what's meant about how ironic, how ironic. <laughs> uh, well, the only point I was going to make was, you do understand death seems to be the ultimate and serious business. Would seem to be the ultimate flag waver to get your attention. <laughs> of other humans, I don't mean the person dead, but <laughs> of those around you. I mean, it's hard to hide you know, a dead person in your presence. People find, you'll notice somebody's dead. <laughs> <laughs> no animal, no, no, no lion, no dog, no bird walks past a, a dead one of its family even. They do not walk past the dead. You can't see any sign of you know, any animal stopping and looking down. And no matter how you try and translate it and analyze the look, get a still photograph and study it. You can't see any sign in the face they walk by and see one of their fellow men or, like I said, one of their family members is dead. You don't see any look like, how ironic. <laughs> <laughs> now I was just using death. We've got all the other manifestations in which people will scoff, laugh, ridicule. And if it doesn't seem to have that uh, patina to it, they will simply point out or make the comment, how ironic. That is, you would have never expected this. This was not to be reasonably expected. Uh, assuming that you caught the gist of my full sarcastic act there for a second for me to say what kind of idiots and would say that. How can they expect to be taken? How can, they ex how can they support the claim to themselves of being reasonable, intelligent, sophisticated men and women and say, how ironic? And you say, well, do you know what irony means? I go, yo, it's just how unexpected. And you think, how can you, how can you walk around? How can you pass yourself off? How can you believe that you have anything resembling, let's go back to the dictionary, look up the word intelligent. Look up the word conscious. How can you say that that's ironic? Out of the sarcastic act, if I had an ordinary person's mind, you can follow, and they would listen for a second after they said something was ironic, and if I didn't make it judgmental and sarcastic, uh, I dare say that you could get most ordinary minds to get a quick glimpse, like I, I keep doing this example, that I normally could, that I can, or anybody could, if you knew what you were doing, that you, you could point out to somebody. If you could get them to you know, say, that's an interesting word, irony. It's an interesting concept of people is, that would use the word irony and say, well, things happen in life, in everyday life. Things happen that you just never expect. You would just never expect this result from that situation. You would never expect this outcome from what had transpired before. And if you talk to him a few minutes, and we're talking about just ordinary, we're not talking about anything spooky or supposedly otherworldly or all that crap. I'm just talking about everyday affairs of man. And you, if you could get them to speak for a second and ponder it, and you'd say, well, doesn't that strike you strange? I mean, it's hard after talking to you. You're an intelligent person. Thank you. Obviously insightful. Thank you. Thank you. But doesn't it strike, I mean, it strikes me as strange. I'm just curious. You said that's ironic. And I'm just trying to figure why you said that. Uh, and if you start talking about the situation, I won't even bother to come up with one, but just something every day. And you talk to them, I still submit for a split second. Is in almost all these instances, at least I make up the example and say I could, I could get an ordinary mind to get a glimpse, to at least strike them momentarily. And when I tried to get them to the point of, isn't it strange that you're an intelligent, sophisticated, 
really experienced person and you say that that was ironic, that you didn't expect it. And if I talk to him a minute, I begin to realize that, yeah, I should have expected it. In other words, I misspoke. That's not true for me to say that that was unexpected. That, you know, once you draw it out like you just did and put it that way, you're right. I, was, I, I wasn't ironic. But then they just have to look off. Because it doesn't mean anything. They can't make any use of it. If they stayed on it in the ordinary thinking mode, all it would do is very quickly become an assumed assault on their intelligence. Because the mind of ordinary people can momentarily, as I submit, they, it can get momentary glances of more objective views of life, but they can't dwell on it. Because if they dwell on it, uh, it becomes an assumed attack upon their previous thinking. That's all they can do with it. They begin, when they begin to feel, never mind. What they cannot see, what the ordinary mind what thinking cannot see is that thinking is a parallel life that's being led. What can never be seen is, uh, I'll restate it quite crudely. Let me restate it as a theory. You know, because the FCC and all that crap. Uh, here's my theory. You can't be held responsible for theories. Just something I thought of. <laughs> My theory is that regardless of how educated, sophisticated, verbal, adroit, educated, learned you are, your body leads your life. Your body leads your life. Forget it. Get out of here. <laughs> Don't tell me anything else. That's my theory. <laughs> that is, I know you think otherwise. But here's my other theory. Thinking has no choice but to think otherwise. <laughs> What's thinking going to think? Those of you who uh, have limited experience in the business world, it is quite common to find... Uh, Someone in the shipping department who believes they're smarter than the man who started the company is now the CEO, the president. It's very common on a sports team to find a bat boy, a water boy, who believes that he knows more than the winning coach. It is also quite common to believe, for men to believe that they know more than life, which is why they made up the idea of an actual God of some figure so they could verbally kick him around. Thinking, I guess I ought to clear all that up. <laughs> the guy in the stock room, the water boy, if they do not talk to themselves in that manner, they get fired. They will be dismissed. Oh, I see those strange looks. Not by the coach, not by the owner of the company. They would fire themselves. Well, let me put it to you in a more spiritual vein. The, <laughs> The lower you are down on the non-physical food chain, the more it's required that you blow smoke up your own ass. <laughs> Back to where we were. Thinking cannot see, thinking cannot see in any ordinary human, thinking cannot see that it, constructively speaking, that it has nothing to do with the life you lead. I did say all this was my theory, right? Yeah, okay. If this theory were true, which is obviously a crackpot theory, if this theory were true, do you realize it would answer, again, every question that troubles such great institutions as theology, psychology, and all of human civilization? All human behavior, which has been described as ranging from inexplicable to severely inexplicable, would instantly be made splicable. <laughs> if, this, if this crazy theory had any validity and that thinking had nothing to do with the life you lead, then do you realize that for now 
as best the ordinary people know for five, four or five thousand years of recorded history that men have been dealing with problems that, how shall I put it? <laughs> dealing with questions, how shall I put it? Uh, is don't exist, is that too strong? <laughs> if thinking has nothing to do with the life you lead, the life you lead, you're born, some number of years go by, you die. If indeed taking this momentary ad hoc division into a man, into his mind and his body, if his body led that life, Do you understand that religion, psychology, which covers about all of it, is it's no more than a dream. Of course, it's no more a dream than all of civilization, but the very specific areas to which those two fields ostensibly apply themselves. Now, what is the nature of life, which was normally religion's bailiwick, and then psychology picked up what appeared to be a different area, which is ultimately the same, but psychology then picked up as its purview, what is the nature of man? What is the nature of man's behavior? And in neither case have they ever come to a satisfactory conclusion, which is no attack on them. They will never come to any satisfactory conclusion. Thinking does not come to a satisfactory conclusion. That's not the job of thinking. Thinking is open-ended, the same way as man's nervous system, and man continue to think, never coming to any satisfactory conclusion. So those two areas that would seem to be of extreme importance, and on the surface they would seem to be of extreme importance to people interested in such as this. Because to uh, accept what it's normally referred to or has been as being some kind, of meta, uh, some kind of mystical quest or mystical activity, you would normally assume, whether you agreed with it or had any interest, you would say, well, at least people like that believe themselves even more seriously more acutely interested in the questions regarding the nature of life, the nature of man, than even ordinarily religious people. You don't have to agree with it or find that to be a favorable notation, but that would be a sophisticated man's attitude toward, if we just said, well, this kind of activity, it fits the definition of mystical. And they go, well, then you people above all, well, you, know, you could be deluded, but you people above all would be more seriously interested in such questions as what is the nature of life and what is the nature of man, or especially his behavior, and of course, I, you couldn't respond, but the answer is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I might not necessarily put it in that way if I was addressing a Norwegian audience. <laughs> or even a Finnish audience. <laughs> it does appear that way. That is the history of humanity. That is the history of philosophy. That is the history of religion. And that is the history of each individual person who is wired up and caught up into this kind of activity, that you go through it, uh, through a complete process, that the question is serious. And if the question is serious, that is, what is the nature? What am I, in words, what is the nature of life? What am I doing here? What is, why do people behave as they do? Why do I behave as I do? That not only are the, seri are the questions, uh, without any doubt, without any analyzation, the questions are assumed. It's a fait accompli that the questions are serious. Thus, it also follows, ergo. <laughs> After that, the answers, should we find them, or where we should be searching for them, will be a serious area. Area. That is, if it's serious questions, it's obvious that the answers are going to be serious, not some kind of crackpot, sh you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what. I mean, the answers are going to be serious. And I got to tell you again, we don't have any Swedes, do we? <laughs> the response to that's the same as before. And of course, I'm being crude, I think. <laughs> what I was inferring is that the mind, the thinking about the questions will never get you anywhere. It's not a matter of whether the answer you come up with is <laughs> or not. Because the fact is, you're never going to come up with an answer. So it doesn't matter if I go... <laughs> And so anybody who took umbrage of that, it just shows that you still deal in faux umbrage. <laughs> <laughs> you got no basis 
to be umbrella ties. <laughs> Of course, I just heard somebody think, well, that's ironic. <laughs> I started to say it's a good thing that our area here to record this, this little studio is no larger than it is, but then I thought it's a good thing that our thinking ability is no larger than it is. <laughs> Again, what if, what if this absolutely insane theory of mine, it's just for today, by the way, I know. In case anybody tries to turn me in, I'll deny it tomorrow. <laughs> what if this absolutely crazy idea that the body leads the life you lead and that thinking has nothing to do with it? Thinking is another life going on. Uh, since I've got to kill another few minutes to run the tape out, I'll point, I'll point out the obvious, which I've done before, in this way and another. In the world of thought, in man's civilized intellectual world, what I have just said is absolute insanity doesn't begin to cover it. It's just foolish. It's not even worth really responding to for me to say, in my crackpot theory, that the last men lead are, are led by their bodies and thinking has nothing to do with it. From any civilized, sane attitude, I can take the other position, I can defend them, no need for you to show up. That is insanity. As I said, it's not, it doesn't even deserve that sobriquet. It's not even worth responding to. It's ridiculous. It's just, it's just meaningless. It's, it's just silly. But who said that? This example, of course I'm not talking to anybody now that has any idea what I'm really talking about, but for anybody else, <laughs> consider this. Now notice, I can tell you beforehand, thinking can find a way out of it, and I can do it for you. Yeah. Thinking can always find a way out of comparative examples, if nothing else, on the basis of, let's all say it together, irony, yeah. but never mind. <laughs> We all know this. We all know this. A person through a trauma can be rendered unconscious. They can be put in a, a non-conscious state just based on medical terminology and diagnosis. And the person can live out their full appointed days as they used to say in the Old Testament. They can lay there in bed and live 70 years and be no more conscious than a fill in the blank. <laughs> <laughs> they simply can live you know damn well you can physiologically live and not be conscious and again the, or, an ordinary mind can dismiss that and say well you're being again extremely silly because such a person is not actually living a life they're not up going to the theater and the movies and reading books I know that I, I agree but everything they mention remember this is the life of thinking so the point is, and I am not preaching to those, who, <laughs> to anybody who can understand it, I'm just killing time to talk to those who are still watching on the radio. <laughs> that you literally, it is no secret, no one can deny this, you literally, physiologically, physically, can live and not have a mental life. Beyond that, in that example, any thinking person, I won't even bother to do it, any thinking person can dismiss that. While agreeing that, oh yeah, physically you can live out your years, but that's not living. That's not a human. I know, I agree. It's not a human life, but you can live. What are you going to call it? Well, it's a, it's a human life, but it's not live fully. I know, half of it's gone. The parallel thinking life. But that one life is still there. Beyond that, we'll leave the uh, hospital room of the catatonic person we're referring to. Of course, it's always hard to tell which room to leave or which one you're in. But <laughs> that only has any practical use when you realize that you are a large metropolitan hospital <laughs> and you are full of rooms in which lie 
catatonic bodies. <laughs> Boy, shit, going by your name. You look around their wrist, and there's your name. And you go to the next room. I just thought I'd mention it to you. See a, see a lawyer. Get out of town. Get well. Close up the hospital. That is only half a life. And ordinary people could dismiss it. But again, I'll point out, think about yourself. What is missing in such a life? That even though you could live 70 years, be in fairly good health. Matter of fact, off the point for a second, but you do realize many people, many quite ordinary, middle class, civilized people, if they were in a coma, at the age of 70, would probably be in better physical shape than had they been conscious. <laughs> God, is that ironic? Watch it. Do I have to repeat that? Many people, sane, decent people, the backbone of society and civilization, many people, were they unconscious? And we fast forwarded 60 or 70 years, right there at their death, or 60 or 70 years of them laying there in a coma in a hospital room, bed. Would, all things considered, many people would be in better physical condition. You know, having been force fed and just good sugar water and <laughs> nourishing enemas or however they feed them. <laughs> they would be in better physical shape than had they led a fully conscious civilized life. Again, I leave it if you want to think about that. All right. That is something to think about, isn't it? If you're out there listening on your radio, to ponder, assuming you hear that there could be just a whiff of validity to that, to think, you mean if I was unconscious, I'd be in better shape? <laughs> God, it's frightening, isn't it? But think about this. Civilized adults are only frightened by real things. It's only children frightened by imaginary spooks. So if that actually frightens you, consider that. And don't pass it off as being ironic. Go, why does that frighten me? The possibility is if I were unconscious... You know, probably 20 years from now, I'd probably be in better shape than I am now. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Enough of that. If you think about what would be missing, since we all agree that that is not a fully realized life of a human being, to be laying somewhere in a hospital bed or on the side of the road in a gutter, in a ditch, to be unconscious, that is to have a non-functioning intellect. And there are people, you don't have to actually be catatonic, I assume you understand. There are people that, in one sense or the other, uh, are not catatonic, are not immobile, but through certain traumas and even genetic damage, uh, have no functioning intellect. <coughs> when they do not, they... They're constructively rendered almost uh, non-laterally animated. And they, they just get and walk over to where there's food and maybe go to the bathroom if you could housebreak them. But the point is, you can be a human being physically, live without an intellect, without the cortical intellect operating. That which we call the thinking side. I mean, there's limits to how much brain damage you can have done, obviously, or I assume you know, that will affect other functions because the brain does more than just run our tongues and our imagination. But at any rate, if the thinking operations of the brain are dismissed, done away with, lacking, a person can still live. They can live out their appointed days more or less, physically. And then when it's pointed out, when you consider, yeah, well, they may live, but that is not a fully realized human. I wouldn't want to be that way, and I'm sure they wouldn't if they had their choice. That is not a fully, human, a fully realized human being. Correct. Then point out what is missing. Think about it. And I started on it, uh, flogging you to death with examples for those of you out there on the radio is not going to do a damn bit of good anyway. Or else you wouldn't be listening to me on your electric washing machine. 
But if you named, if we all agreed, well, that is not the fully realized life of a human being. You cannot call that being alive in the human sense. Okay. What is lacking? I mean, the people are getting food, they're getting rest, their heart's beating, they're going to live another 60 or 70 years. But we agree that is not a human life. So, what is missing? I just named a few things 15 minutes ago, but just think about it. Now, just divide, because this is possible, you can imagine this, that there is someone without a functioning intellect, or if you really got to push the example, actually in a catatonic state. They're in a coma. But there they are physically living. They do not need machines other than be fed. At any rate, they, they live physically. And you go, yeah, but that's not a human existence. Okay. What is that person missing? Now start naming it. Start thinking about it. All the things that they're missing. But no sarcasm. But just start naming it. What an ordinary person would. What you're thinking would respond. How it would respond. Of what is missing. All of the things that are unique to human existence is what you'd name. And so it's absolutely up to you. It'd be open to anybody who wants to you know, name something. If it's unique to human existence, then it fits into what they're missing, obviously. Then the part that ordinary thinking absolutely loses it is then after people, I let people name. If I was talking to somebody, if I was talking to all of human thinking, and they name all of the activities, all of the aspect, well, all the activities that, hum, that that body, that that human, that that mortal, that homo sapien laying there without a functioning intellect, all that they're missing. If I let them name everything until everybody was satisfied, they named everything that's unique. Fine dining, sports, art, politics, economics. Anything you want to name, it'll fit. If it's unique to human existence, go ahead and put it on the list of the things that person's missing. Then we get through with the list. And here's the part that I'm suggesting, as always, that you can find something to use inside of your own consciousness. But ordinary thinking will lose it after that. If I say, well, notice that everything on this list that you named, which I, you know, I, I can't disagree with that, that is what they're missing by not being conscious that you've got a fine list here. Do you realize that everything on that list is a product of thinking? There might be a few people that would suddenly be struck, well, just momentarily on the fact, well, well, hell yeah, but so what? The rest of them would miss it entirely. In either case, it wouldn't do them any good. Because after that, if somebody even, if I was trying to push it, if I was trying to make a, selling a, some notion to ordinary minds, and after that, they'd, because they'd look curious, like, well, what's the point? Now I have to say, all right, here's the point. And there's no way to express this. This is the most common way, and so I'm going ahead and do it. I would say, well, you, you realize that all of those things you named are products of thinking. There would be no opera, there'd be no politics, there would be no art, there would be no social life of man, there would be no gourmet dining. There would be none of that if man was simply a physical creature. The body would have never come up with anything on that list. That if you can picture the body like having its own interest in its own life and then man's mind having another one, they go, okay, just for theory, for speculation, I can agree to that. And I go, the body would have never, ever, 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 never even come up with anything resembling this. And they might go, so? Then everything on that list is a product of thinking. It, sir, it comes from thinking. And they might go, so? And here's where you either see it or you don't, because if I was going to push it further, as I said, the only thing I could say to an ordinary mind, or the most profitable thing, which is still totally unprofitable, is I'd say, well, compared to the body, everything on that list is imagination, which is not true. Not in the sense that ordinary people use imagination. In this sense, if somebody ordinarily, some ordinary person was saying this, they would then be using ordinary, uh, imagination or imaginary as an assault. It would be a condemnation, a reproach of what the person was of the list. But it's not that. It is imaginary in the sense. It's not the right word. There's no word. But it's imaginary in the sense. It's imaginary vis-a-vis. -vis. It's imaginary CF, the interest of the body. Compared to the interest of the body, all of these things are imaginary, comparably speaking. The proof being back to the, well, the proof. Wouldn't prove it to them, but 
the evidence being back to my body and my human, back in a catatonic state. It's now living on the basis of what is real. That is, which is necessary. Perhaps be a better word, but still the mind, ordinary thinking would never get it. That everything on the list is not, is unnecessary. Because then they'd say, well, you can say unnecessary, but we're back to, they'd blame it on me, or my example is, so we're back to your body, your human in a coma, that yeah, he's alive, and he lives 70 years, but that's not a human life. That's not, a, that's not the life of a civilized person. I go, yeah, I know. So then they would say, well, now you're saying that everything on the list that makes man unique, all the activities in which he engages that are unique to him, you're, you call them unnecessary. But then they would say, well, we're back to where you we were before. You're just saying that we don't actually need it to live, but I'm saying we need it to live a full, civilized human life. And of course, as always, I think, why do I even talk to them? <laughs> uh, does anybody see the basis of humor? I, I assume I've made my point. As always, it's very interesting to talk for 45 or 50 minutes to make one point and to see people leave and of course, what used to be fun is to see people leave and realize that they had forgotten that I was going to make a point. <laughs> then sometimes I've, throughout the years, I've seen crowds that here and there, somebody would even later think, or even while I was hanging around, go, wait a minute, you never did get to the point. Do you call that progress? <laughs> if you do not see that there are two lives that men are leading, and you can see it, you can see it right in front of you, humor being the most blatant, from one view, the most blatant evidence of it. You can hear it. You can see it. You can see people laugh and not even hear them from a distance. You can see somebody, you know the expression. It's unique to man. Why are they laughing? At any time, why are they laughing? Let's go back to, in the Western world, the classic joke. Or it used to be considered the classic joke. Uh, who was that lady I saw you with last night? I was no lady, that was my wife. <laughs> now, I've taken that apart before. Well, you can see the hostility. We're back to that. But consider past the hostility now. It still, is, it still fits. Why is that funny to some people? I was no lady, that was my wife. It's because people live two parallel simultaneous lives. And marriage is a life of the mind. Life is, marriage is not a life, of course, wife or husband can be turned the other way. That represents marriage, of course. What it is, is on the list of things, because a man or a woman laying in a coma will not get married. <laughs> they will never ask, if you're waiting by the bed of this <laughs> handsome man or this beautiful girl, expecting them to invite you into the institution of holy matrimony, you will be sorely disappointed. They will never, it will never cross their mind, which of course there's the trick. If you do not have a mind, there's no such thing as marriage. That joke, and I can take any other sense of, you, think about yourself, anything that's funny, you can see it that if you take this analysis of, you go, if you start with the basis that men are living two simultaneous parallel lives, the life of the body and the life of the mind, then you can see what's being laughed at is, is the basis of irony is why I said it should have been the real name for humor because the mind is talking one thing. The mind is talking, yes, I'm married. I have a beautiful wife. I love to be married. I want to be married. The whole smear, that's just one aspect of civilization. I, it's no, I didn't single it out for any particular reason, but there it is. It is a prime aspect of civilization. Not just screwing, loving. <laughs> Not just engaging in sex, engaging in marriage. Who was that lady I saw you with last night? That's no lady, that's my wife. That's a man commenting inadvertently. And the people who laugh inadvertently. No one understands why it's funny. Oh, they could try to analyze, well, it means that the guy's now sick of his wife, or he's, after being married, he decided, she's no lady. Or he's saying, you don't know her like I know her. Forget all that and put it in your head. That is the two sides of man laughing. That's one side. There's a, a man, is humanity en masse being aware of the fact without being able to analyze it that we're living two different lives. And the only thing that makes it funny is, oh, we talk marriage, but half of us know nothing about marriage. How ironic. <laughs> or put, writ larger. Men are continually talking about civilization. That is, the output, the product 
of the, of the thinking life of man. But then half of him has no interest in it. And so all the time he's talking about it, if somebody else is talking about it, they're a sitting duck for sarcasm, for somebody to laugh at them, or for it to be ironic. They catch a priest, a defender of the church, the sanctity of marriage, a uh, celebrant, and they catch him with choir boys. And people go, Phew. you know, people who are not of that faith, and perhaps they'll laugh and make fun of it. And somebody else will go, how ironic. There's nothing ironic. There's nothing funny. Well, the, the funniness is that there's two lives going on. That's, that's funny in the same way that, that's no lady, that was my wife. That man, the body, is leading one life. Simultaneously, man is leading a life of the mind. And the mind is the one who's describing the life being led. And it's only leading half the life being led. And if you think, that's like walking around and you're naked half the time. You follow? Or you're walking around and you're half naked all the time. According to how you want to look at it. i got news for you. Let's say you're walking around half naked all the time. Like you're dressed from this side and over here you got nothing on. It's like you walk around like this. But all you got to do is slightly turn or somebody from a different view get over here. And they find you ridiculous. Now, of course, forget physical. That'd be true physically. But again, to the non-physical world, that's why you know, different groups of people find other groups of people or people with different ideas, they find them funny. Different religion, different political view, or just individuals. You look at other people and you think, you know, what a laugh. Get a load of that guy. All you're saying is, or assuming that there was some basis, not just physical hostility, but you're laughing at something in the intellectual world, the civilized world, the personality world, what you're laughing at is the realization you can't put into words, or you don't want to, is that he talks one life and leads another one. Or at times they conflict to such a degree that it's, ha, ha, ha. You know, it's a good thing that men don't see more, or we, they'd hardly be in time for talk. <laughs> all you would do would be laugh. <laughs> that all get on? That's all.